Are they looking after the interests of their community and the people in those communities? Or are they looking to advance their own careers and lifestyles? Let's hear it straight from the horse's mouth in a meeting with the CEO that we had early on in the piece when we asked him why he got involved in local council. One thing really that I, I, I need to clarify from you was the whole idea of serving the CEO on the local council to, you, to represent the community or is it just a job for you? I mean really that's, that's what we want to know. Sure. And then, you know, that will then depend on... Um, Why did I start? Yeah, what, 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 um, no, what was the reason that you... Okay. And, um, and it was, it was a, a real good option and I enjoyed working with people. The words we heard were politics and opportunity. The words public service are foreign to our so-called representatives. The lack of representation and transparency is absolutely astounding. Now, we could be wrong, but it seems that local politics is the new starting place and career choice for individuals who want to create business opportunities and countless networks with government backing and access to endless resources and the lucrative public purse at the expense of you and I. Melton Council alone gouged an additional $4.262 million to top up their own superannuation while everyone else in their own communities suffered severe losses in the retirement funds, particularly since the global financial crisis. If our representatives don't feel and experience the pain of their communities they claim to represent, how can they qualify to make decisions for the rest of us? And don't think for a moment that this is unique to Melton Council. Geelong City Council gouged its ratepayers an extra $23 million for superannuation. In fact, all local councils around Victoria and perhaps Australia have had to meet shortfalls in their superannuation in the millions. Surely this is mitigated by cutting down expenses in unnecessary areas or in areas where cost savings can be made. Well, not so. Just over a year ago, in December 2011, Melton City Council had awarded a cleaning contract to Elite Property Care after reviewing over 10 companies in the tender process and they were the highest bidder. In fact, they cost the residents within the Shire of Melton an extra $162,000 a year. When the then Mayor, Justin Lamorella, was asked why Elite Property Care had been awarded the contract, his response was that he couldn't discuss it because it had been decided during confidential business. Well, it's confidential business when it's your own money. When it's the community's money, I think they're owed an explanation, particularly when you consider that over the three-year term, our council will be paying almost half a million dollars more than they were previously. So what does all of this have to do with the end game, and in particular local councils? that our farmers and uh, food producers are under. But let me just make the point that um, these policies come from a faraway place. But we are in trouble and um, we all need to pull together on this. I also thank the many people behind the scenes who have helped to educate me on the global issues and how they are being implemented at a state level so that I can be an effective uh, elected member of your parliament. And while I'm speaking to you today, uh, I'm going to quote a number of people from various influential positions uh, on the international stage. And I'll leave it with you to make up your mind uh, if you want to continue to head in the direction that we're going. I first stumbled across Agenda 21 uh, in about 2008. And quite frankly, my first uh, re reaction was to dismiss what I was reading because I didn't believe that any government in Australia would take us down this road. Um, the words Agenda 21, ladies and gentlemen, were never meant to be spoken. And if they were, then of course it would be dismissed as a conspiracy theory. 
Because if people knew Agenda 21 and what it stood for, there's plenty of information out there where they could actually learn uh, what the end game was. Ladies and gentlemen, the origins of the environmental movement as we see it began back in 1968 when the Club of Rome was formed. The Club of Rome has been described as a crisis think tank which specialises in crisis creation. The main purpose of this think tank was to formulate a crisis that would unite the world and condition us to the idea of global solutions to local problems. In a document called The First Global Revolution, authored by Alexander King and Bertrand Schneider, on pages 104 and 105 it stated, in searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers, of course, will be caused by human intervention that will require a global response. That's the origin of global warming, ladies and gentlemen. In 1975, Australia agreed to bring in a new economic order via the Lima Declaration on the second conference of the United Nations Industrial Development Organisation. The outcome of this was, as I said, the Lima Declaration, which was a blueprint for the redeployment of tools, jobs and manufacturing to the developing nations, leaving countries like Australia short of technology, a manufacturing base and jobs. Blind Freddy can now see what the outcome of that has been for our country. It has been put to me that all of these treaties were the foundation for the rollout of Agenda 21. And it seems that Australia has been moved around the global chessboard and our so-called leaders were either complicit or naive to the long-term consequences. And now we're almost a checkmate. In 1992, former President of the United States, George Bush Senior said, Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action will be integrated into individual and collective decision making at every level. For everyone here tonight not familiar with Agenda 21, I would suggest that this is the beginning of your learning curve, not the end. In 1992, Morris Strong, Secretary General of the UN Earth Summit and member of the Club of Rome said, it is clear that current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake consumption of large amounts of frozen and convenience foods, use of fossil fuels, ownership of motor vehicles, small electrical appliances, home and air workplace air conditioning and suburban housing are not sustainable. Put those statements together with the previous one and it must become clear that Agenda 21 is about controlling every aspect of our lives, how we eat, what we eat, how much we eat, how we move around, food production, the amount of food and where we even live. From a report in the 1976 UN's Habitat One conference, land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset, controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth therefore contributes to social injustice. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, if you work hard and you exercise good financial management and invest in property, you are contributing to social injustice. Harvey, Harvey Reuven, Vice Chair of the Wildlands Project says, individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective. J. Gary Lawrence, advisor to President Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development, Participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring out many of the conspiracy fixated groups and individuals in our society, and here we are. This segment of our society who fear one world government and UN invasion 
through which our individual freedoms will be stripped away, would actively work to defeat any elected official who joined the conspiracy by undertaking Agenda 21. So we will call our process something else. We will call it comprehensive planning or growth management or smart growth. We ended up with sustainable development. I was speaking to a person last week and he said to me, if Hitler was still around, he'd be sitting back thinking, I didn't need bullets for a global takeover. And he'd be right. We see daily cash grabbing via new taxes called levies, supposedly because we are cash strapped in this state, and at the same time see big project spending that does not fit with the message that we are in financial crisis. But we the people have to tighten our belt, while the government seems absolutely unaware and unconcerned of the amount of debt that it is accumulating. The parliament has also ventured into the rights of people to own and retain their property and manage it without government interference the intrusions into our property that land producers are going through will roll out into the suburbs and into the city because they have the authority to do that. We all have already fiddled in Parliament with land titles of people in rural areas. At the same time that our right to own and manage our land, have access to water, produce adequate food to ensure that our only option is not to consume often toxic and substandard food from places like China, this government has been working overtime to take away our rights to common law through many pieces of legislation. Common law is what guarantees us an ability to correct injustices. This coming year, I promise you, you will also hear debate over a number of pieces of legislation that will further erode our common law rights. And you have to get behind me on this, ladies and gentlemen, to stop this from going through. As Agenda 21 became more and more apparent to me, I began using the line in Parliament, the government was now declaring war on its own citizens. And that goes back as far as 2008. This of course led me to being labelled a conspiracy theorist. But here we are now, openly talking about Agenda 21 and the ramifications we will see in a short period of time if this is not stopped in its tracks. For way too long now, we the people have been asleep at the wheel and it is time to wake up and participate in the democratic process. And to do that, you need to understand the parliamentary and political system that you are trying to rein in. In 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev, also a member of Club of Rome, said, we are moving toward a new world order, the world of communism, and we shall never turn off that road. He also quoted in 1996 Monetary and Economic Review on page 5, the environmental crisis will be the international disaster that will unlock the new world order, one world government. In 1992 came the Earth Summit, which produced the document called the Earth Charter. This document was co-written by Morris Strong, long-time globalist, elitist, member of Club of Rome, and Mikhail Gorbachev. Both Strong and Gorbachev stated that it was hoped that this document would be adopted as the new Ten Commandments, with environmentalism as the new one world religion. Out of this summit came Agenda 21. Ladies and gentlemen, everything I've said here tonight can be verified by document searches. And it is now time for us all to take off our blinkers and encourage our neighbours to take off their blinkers. So the question that Lord Moncton asks, carbon tax, climate change and Agenda 21, can democracy survive all three, needs to be answered and answered now. Governments using UN policies have become our greatest threat to individual freedoms for three reasons. First, because it has given governments the crux it needs to implement policies under the guise of sustainability that exert greater control over our energy use, resource use, property rights, finance, transport and mobility. Secondly, through these controls they're able to cede governance and sovereignty from the people with the support of unelected foreign powers and bureaucrats who are out of touch with the reality on the ground and who may also have vested interests in maintaining the status quo. 
And finally, Agenda 21 is a policy that is being used as a weapon against the people. It's implemented at grassroots local levels through an authority that has imposed itself on the community and calls itself government. That is, local councils. United Nations has evolved into an organisation far from the ideals it was created upon and has the guise of sustainability and environmental protection and biodiversity with which local governments have been given unchecked powers to effectively steal property, individual property rights and strip the wealth from the communities of average Australians. The so-called UN Sustainability Program regulating and restricting people are one of the many facets of Agenda 21 underway through local councils in Australia right now. In fact, some countries like the US have, in three of their states, recently voted to ban Agenda 21 policies being implemented through local municipalities altogether. Not only is it highly unconstitutional and treasonous with bureaucrats to dictate how you and I should govern our communities, but what's worse is that our true and constitutional government has long been infiltrated and we are almost at the end of the line. That is, an infiltration by imposters posing as government in a power struggle where they rely on the self-interest and greed of individuals in positions of authority on a local level and those who make the decisions to further the agenda of a foreign ruling power and a complete takeover by stealth. Local government to these foreign powers becomes the victim in the first line of attack with which to usurp our freedoms particularly when this level of government is infested with individuals who will maintain the status quo for reasons of self-preservation. You see, the problem is not so much the environmental movement, but more so the fact that the rollout of the agenda has been placed into the hands of a small group of people with far too much control and power who are susceptible to corruption with no parliamentary oversight, wholly supported by the government to the extent that they use it against the people in order to further their own personal agendas. In effect, making the communities victims of the environment instead of the stewards and dictating growth and sustainability at the expense of individual rights. These unelected organisations have far too much sway. Some examples of these are the MAV, the Municipal Association of Victoria, and ICLEI the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. And you only need to look at your own council to see how your local council to dictate the agenda of these foreign powers, namely the UN. Here is a small but recent example right here in Melton. No one can deny that yes, we are in need of childcare, but far from the impression that is given asking for parents to participate in the creation of a program, that meets the needs of the community and for their input on what the community wants. The truth is that the program path has already been designed so that it guides the outcome. They called it the Municipal Early Years Plan. And it says in its introduction that the City of Melton Municipal Early Years Plan is a local plan that outlines the vision for children zero to 12 years in the municipality. The plan was supposedly developed in consultation with parents, but reading carefully, you'll find that it was actually created from an existing plan provided by UNICEF, that is, the United Nations Children's Fund, to create none other than child-friendly cities. Hardly a program conceived entirely by the community, but rather a program conceived by a foreign power, facilitated by local council, and steered by private interests. Parents were merely used to fill in the gaps so that they can be lulled into believing it was their idea. This is also called the Delphi Technique, a technique used in times of peace to wage a silent war against the people. And how will this technique be used against us? Quite simply, we will create a generation who will not so much as batter an eyelid when the parents of children get a $1.1 million fine for simply building a cubby house without considering the environmental impact. 
A Wollongong family is facing a million dollar fine for building a cubby house. This is a popular hideout for the kids of Stanwall Tops. Because it's a nice place to play in without um, parents and we can play outside instead of inside. It was built six months ago without council approval and it wasn't long before at least one neighbour complained. Why didn't the parents build it legally in the first place? The council found the cubby house was built in a bushfire prone area without development consent. In a letter to the family, they said it breached the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act and the owners could be fined $1.1 million. They've got to do their job, they've got to respond to him. But then to issue us with a $1.1 million fine, he thinks it's fantastic. If they were a kid, they would probably want to have a cubby like this. But Alan Bond says rules are rules and children aren't exempt. As long as whatever is done in the area by anyone that is legally approved by council. We risk creating a generation of children who, just like our friend Alan Ball, instead of being appalled by such actions of council, will in fact applaud such actions. Another recent example, it's clear that local councils act well above their authority. It is again our own community with WBASE, that is, the Western Business Accelerator and Centre for Excellence. Now, at first glance, and by reasoning of the title of the project, it would seem that we're spending $21 million on creating a centre where businesses in and around Melton City are able to receive training, support, access to resources, and network with other businesses to create jobs, opportunity, and raise the employment prospects of the most vulnerable in our community. Now, it all sounds great, but on closer inspection, this business centre is solely focused on the property development industry to give developers, builders and, of course, associated businesses the tools and a focal point for collaboration in the Melton Precinct. In fact, a recent article says, the Centre for Excellence will provide training for construction businesses on issues such as environmentally sustainable building design and construction. Small business owners will be able to access training in business management skills. So not only is it not a jobs creation project in general, as the community are led to believe, but instead of attracting elements of our communities who are focused on providing innovative alternatives to aspects of, say, our local economy and the way we live and work in the area, we're instead attracting elements of a single industry, namely construction and property development, who are solely focused on profits and pay only lip service to environmental sustainability in order to make their proposals more palatable and in order to secure public funds under the sustainability banner. And this is all for something that business should be funding themselves. So when the W base gets off the ground and their constructions impose on the environment instead of support it, and people are driven off their land because developers invade it or they're rated off, sustainability gets to be the culprit and gets itself a bad name. Just consider for a moment what $21 million spent on, say, an organic farm or a farm-to-table market could do for not only improving job prospects and the creation of a whole new local economy, but also improving the health and the well-being of the residents, which could lead, of course, to much less medical intervention in the future, less imports on the whole, and transport costs and ultimately less emissions and use of fossil fuels. I mean, isn't that a better environmental plan with benefits all round and actually going to the community directly? The problem is though, that those who are in a position to make it happen won't realise a direct economic benefit as a result of its rollout. So instead the community gets a business centre that a minuscule percentage of the community will actually use, if at all. What I'm saying is that we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater simply because rogue elements have perverted the community's genuine desire to protect the environment by usurping the concept for their own benefit. Local councils were always intended to be the volunteer community hubs and advocates of the community to the state governments to address its needs. Instead, we find local councils have become a money-hungry machine with other people's money and very often spending far outside its authority. When the spending exceeds the budget, they raise the rates and the charges for those services that provide little if no benefit to the community. How we say the business centre, for example, outside local council's authority. 
because the public funding being used is not helping provide services to the community as a whole and what's in the interest of the community as a whole, but rather public funding, the rates, fees and taxes you and I pay, are being used to benefit an already privileged but small sector in the community, being the property development industry. This all seems more like the actions of property developers and advocates of big business in the guise of local government. It's like an out of control teenager with a credit card, except mum and dad get to foot the bill. On a state and federal level, the self-interest of our politicians, with the exception of a few of course, is much worse. The Gillard government just announced that they're going to spend $10 million of our money to run a campaign to promote their own agenda being the constitutional recognition of local government. The waste and spending outside of our government's authority at every level of government is ridiculous and taxpayers should be absolutely outraged. All of these issues could be easily fixed if it were up to the individual communities to decide what is best for them using a balance of their own needs with those of the environment. But the problem is that local councils and governments at all level have such a stranglehold on the democratic process and stifle and obstruct the efforts of even genuine representatives in order to steer and mould a picture that fits their own needs and makes it difficult but not impossible to change the direction we're headed in. What we have to realise is that our money on a federal, state and even local level is being used for our own enslavement and is taking away our rights. In effect, we're feeding the beast. We have allowed the unfettered spread of corrupt bureaucracies to co-opt the environmental movement, which is now just, just another business. business. The health of our planet and our rights are inextricably tied. It will be destroyed if we fail to uphold our rights. We have to understand that protecting our birthrights and the natural trust as stewards of the landmass that we call Australia is protecting the environment. They are not, as we have been led to believe, mutually exclusive. We require a rethink and fast. Because the hard-hitting reality is that if we're unable to protect our own natural rights as human beings, how can we possibly protect the rights of the living organism we call the planet Earth? Our planet and its condition is a reflection of our own being. Nothing in this reality escapes the maxim, as, as above, above, so, so below. below. It seems that in the pursuit of our self-importance we've forgotten that the planet doesn't need us to sustain life. We need the planet to sustain life. We must therefore make it a priority to rein in the bureaucracies, restore our common law rights and true constitution, particularly in the justice system, and stamp out corruption. This requires the political will and the fortitude by an ever-vigilant public. We can't restore our rights, however, if we don't know what they are, and in particular, who we are. To begin to understand this, we need to understand the basics of a trust. So we're back for another volume of Good Vibrations and I'm on the line today to Australia 
long distance style to uh, Mr. Max Egan, who is a guy that I've been following for quite some time. He does podcasts of his own. Uh, he runs a website called thecrowhouse.com. I'm very excited to be having a chat with him today. How are you doing, Max? I'm doing very well, Mark. Thank you for having me on. Good to talk to you. I'm mindful of the fact that there's going to be a lot of people listening to this podcast who are hearing this information for the first time. I mean, I know that you've put it out many times on your various podcasts and your various other radio appearances. But just for people that are new to the subject, thinking specifically of the legal system that's been set up uh, by the control system, and particularly here in the United Kingdom. I mean, I, I know that you, you understand how the UK law infrastructure works as well as the US uh, and Australia because I know you, you've studied all of them but could you explain to people the important differences between common law known as law of the land and maritime law and the instances in which these are used because although those that have studied the subject will be very familiar with the differences most everyday folk that have never had this stuff explained to them would have no idea that these two even exist in tandem with each other could you just give us a, just a potted uh, overview of what's going on with these? Okay, well, maritime law is really the law of commerce, the law of the sea. And what they've done is they've basically inflicted all of that upon people who are on the land. They've done this through a corporate system. They've basically imposed a corporate system over us. A common law is, is just common law. You know, we do, do no harm. I mean, really, if it gets down to that, I always say even above common law, because common law is even a man-made construct as well, based on what we perceive justice to be. But really, if you look at it as God's law, which is, is true common law, natural law, God's law you can sum up in, in three words, eight letters, do no harm. That's it. Do no harm. You look at trust law and say that basically what's happened is that the government trustees have tricked all the people into believing that they're the trustees, because the trustees are accountable for any damage that's done. But really, it's just all corporate rules that, that don't really apply to us. But you try to stand up against it, and you get eaten up alive because the rest of the community doesn't know this. They just think you're a troublemaker. Yeah. So, you know, you, you've got to try to inform the people that they're living in a fiction. They're living in a paper-based matrix. Uh, it's, it's a very, very complicated issue. I mean, you could, you could spend a long time just trying to explain people the, the ins and outs of, of the law and the legal system. But I think, you know, if we can step above that, and ultimately realise that it's it's all fiction, it's all man-made, the whole lot. We made it all up. Yeah. Ultimately, even under their law, you know, God created man, gave man dominion over the earth. Man created society, society created government, government created statute law. They're way down the food chain. Yeah. We are man, but we have to realise who we are and, and what we're swimming in and what we've got going on here. We've got these, these public trustees who have turned themselves into rulers and just keep, keep writing rules to control our lives because we don't know who we are. Now, you have to appreciate that trusts are far more complex than this. So this is a simplified example of the three types of trust for the purpose of making sense of what will follow. Now, every trust has a grantor or executor of the trust, that is, someone who creates the trust to place the assets in it. A trustee or administrator of the trust is the person responsible for administering the trust according to an agreement or perhaps a will. They are the people who hold it in trust. And finally, there's always a beneficiary of the trust, that is the person or persons who are going to benefit from whatever is held in the trust. Everyone with their first breath of life is born into this natural trust and shares equally. There is no one that can claim more rights to the trust over someone else. This is where the term, we're all born equal, is derived from. So in the natural trust, the grantor would be the creator, whomever or whatever that is for you doesn't matter. But this is the grantor of the natural trust. It's generally accepted that the parents are the trustees who are the caregivers who govern this natural trust according to their own society's culture and rules. Now this is a global human phenomenon. Even the most isolated tribes in the deepest jungles operate within the scope of this natural trust. Now the parents as trustees, or in some cases an entire community or tribe, are responsible to ensure that the beneficiaries of the trust have equal access to, say, the food, shelter and water. 
As trustees, they can also appoint others like, for instance, teachers, a school, dentists, etc. to return benefits to you or the beneficiary of the trust. Your parents as trustees, until we of course reach maturity or come of age, make these decisions on your behalf and for your benefit. The beneficiaries of this would also be your siblings, if you have any, who must also share equally in the trust. So in other words, a parent would be in breach of trust if they were to deny, say, water to one sibling over another. The second type of trust is a private trust. As with the first example, the private trust might be set up by your parents in order to hold in trust an estate or property or investment for you and your siblings. Your parents would need to give instructions to the trustee who might be the family accountant, usually a solicitor in the form of a last will and testament. Now the solicitor's job is to make sure that the beneficiaries, you and your siblings, share equally in the benefits of the trust and according to your parents' will. So let's look now at the final type of trust, a public trust. A typical public trust is a government trust. This is one that you step into when you come of age or reach maturity and no longer require the care of your parents. In the case of Australia, we have the Queen or the Monarch as the grantor of this trust. She is the Supreme Sovereign, who is the Earth's representative of the Creator and who by divine right protects the sovereignty of her subjects through a document known to us as the Australian Commonwealth Constitution 1900. As sovereigns, we have the same rights as the Queen. Because the Queen is not a physically present monarch in Australia, the Governor-General acts in her place, who is also governed by our Constitution. So the grantor of this trust is the Queen, and the executor is you. The Constitution document essentially outlines how the trustees that we appoint, being our elected government, must manage this public trust, how government must be structured, and what the government can and can't do as trustees. In the same way we appoint individuals in a private trust, we also appoint government as public trustees. They perform an administrative service and return the benefits to us as beneficiaries. We enjoy the benefits and the maintenance of the roads, our schools, public health and services, or at least that's how it should work. The Australian people, who are the beneficiaries of this trust, just like all other trusts, the assets of the trust, for want of a better word, whether that be our minerals, gas, everything else in the trust, including the land, is part of the trust, must be shared equally amongst its beneficiaries. I know that most of you by now can already see a huge problem with the trust, as the reality is actually very different. How does this relate to governments and local councils? Well, the public trustees, our government, its officials and representatives, in having sold or privatised anything in the public trust or appointing others without the permission of the grantor or the beneficiaries, this is both a breach of trust and a breach of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. None of these things can be done without the permission of the grantor or the beneficiaries of the trust. How this relates to, say, local government, is that clearly the people voted no on two separate occasions to the establishment and continuance of local government. That should have been the end of it. The reality is that our communities are being stripped and drained of their resources and wealth through a siphoning process that is slow but certain. But how? How is this achieved? Quite simply, it's achieved by interchanging the trust roles depending on the desired outcome. The Local Government Act provides these wide-ranging powers. Local councils as the trustees, the community, the grantor, and you, the resident, the beneficiary. When you move into an area, you pay annual rates, fees, and charges to enjoy the use of the community assets that are held in trust. It might be a community centre, a local park, a library, or the local pools and gym, like our Melton Wave. It might include services like Meals on Wheels, Home Care and of course the familiar and regular rubbish collection. The assets and services in the trust are either partly owned or fully owned by the community, but the council can at any time sell part or all of this community asset without the consent from either parties of the trust. 
Sometimes council can retain the building itself, but sell the management rights. Melton Waves and Gym is a good example of this, where the management rights are sold to private organisations. The proceeds of the sale for the management rights are not used to reduce the general annual rates, evidenced by the fact that annual rates bills never go down, but always increased. And you must now pay an out-of-pocket cost for the use of the community resource at the regular commercial rates. Maintenance, repair or upgrade costs remain the responsibility of the community, which of course adds to the increase of rates. Or in the case of Melton, the W Base, the Western Business Acceleration Centre for Excellence. Not only does the public foot the bill for its development, but the management rights are again sold with the proceeds going to the council and the residents, after having funded its existence, also need to fund its upkeep and then access it at commercial rates. It's like buying a fleet of communal cars which the whole community are responsible for making the loan repayments on, giving them to council to manage and hold in trust for the use of the entire community, but then council sells those management rights to say budget rentals. The community still has to maintain the loan repayments through council, but needing to hire the use of them from a private company at commercial rates. Are we insane for agreeing to this? Add to this the fact that councils can, without any reference or permission from its constituency, take out millions in loans, employ consultants, staff, contractors, determine their own pays and even require the community to fund and support their superannuation retirement. Then you start to wonder if the beneficiaries of local government in theory are the real beneficiaries in practice. The only visible result is an ever-increasing rates bill and additional fees and charges the latest one being the fire levy for Melton residents. This creates a community so laden by ever increasing debt that when they default to either the banks on their mortgage or to their local council on their rates or both, the result is still the same, a loss of property. The only winner is the banks and the council because then even the new owner is subject to council rates, fees and charges. 67% of the costs, in Melton at least, can be attributed to not for the cost of provision of services, but cost of staff and staff benefits. That sounds more like government sanctioned theft to me. In a trust, he who creates the debt is compelled to repay it. So who owes the supposed debt? You? You see, corporations and private businesses take property if you owe them a debt because they don't have any conflicting obligations to you. And in any case, a private debt is something that you're in control of. Our government, however, has the obligation of a trustee and according to our real constitution, which governs the trust, the government's only proper purpose is to protect man's rights, which means to protect him from physical violence to be the policeman acting as an agent of man's self-defence. The only proper functions of a government are the police to protect you from criminals, the army to protect you from foreign invaders, and of course the courts to protect your property and contracts from breach and fraud by others. Doesn't it seem odd, however, that those who are charged with the responsibility of protecting our rights in the trust are the very ones perpetrating the things that they're meant to be protecting us from. The fact is that our constitution, our real constitution, that is supposed to operate in our proper trust by an authentic government known as a de jure government, has been suspended by a Washington DC US registered corporation masquerading as government who operate a foreign constitution belonging to and created by that corporation, who trick us into believing that this is the constitution that applies to the public trust, when in reality, it's the corporation's employment policy and therefore only applies to the employees of the corporation. But then they create departments and the like to 
enforce these policies and injustices through fear, intimidation and threat. UCC Law, which is the acronym for the Uniform Commercial Code, is what corporations registered in Washington DC are required to operate under. We have, in effect, a corporation calling themselves a government, private company employees calling themselves public servants, state managers we refer to as federal ministers, with a prime minister that is in reality a CEO, who are all governed by the corporate policies they refer to as legislation. The business model is quite simply the creation of odious and unnecessary debt in order to harvest the real wealth of a community. Debt servitude cripples the ability of the individual or indeed a community to sustain its basic needs, which in turn becomes the very tool that governments use to convince you and I that we need them. Once they've created this reliance, this in turn allows the implementation of greater controls through laws, new rules and regulations. It's highway rock. At the end of the day, we're going to hand over our properties. They're not buying it, they're taking it. Right. Unbelievable what they're doing to us. And I can't understand it. Will and Faye Evans take the rate rise cake. My rates have gone up 720%. From $3,000 last year to more than $25,000. Now, this may seem slightly off topic, but it is in fact very relevant in understanding why we have government departments, for instance, local councils, pillaging the wealth of the people as against to protecting the wealth of its people, as would of course be expected in accordance with our constitution. How can our constitution have allowed the creation of such a public entity? The answer is that our constitution didn't, but the corporation's constitution did. Let's explore that for a moment. Any office or department that's created must be in accordance with our constitution and sworn into office by our Governor-General. Governor-General is the Queen's representative, the guardian of the constitution if you like, and even has the power to sack the government. The Governor-General assents or signs and seals laws on behalf of the Queen when he or she is satisfied that all the proper processes have been met and gives the final OK. This is called Royal Assent. But what if our Governor-General's office today is not the Governor-General's office of our Constitution? Now, understand that this explanation is very broad and simplistic. Any new office or department must be in accordance with our Letters Patent. Letters Patent can be seen as an addendum or an attachment to our Constitution that lays out the powers of the Governor-General which includes the exclusive power to give official assent to public offices and governments and to swear in its offices. The letter's patent can't be amended or revoked by anyone except an heir or successor of the Queen. Now this ensures that new departments can't be created on a whim that might be in contravention to our Constitution. But again I ask you, what if the Governor-General is not the Governor-General and Guardian of the People and their Constitution on behalf of the Queen, but in fact an employee of a corporation that calls itself the Australian Government? Would that be a problem? Would it allow a government to create any law or department in contravention to the Constitution? Now, Scott Bartle has done some great work in this area in a video called What the FUQ Part 2 so I'll let him explain the rest. Now remember, the Governor-General's office is properly constituted via the letters patent. That is, according to the instructions, limitations and provisions within the letters patent. Just as an introduction, Scott begins by explaining that what we create is an office and then an office holder. The office is created by the introduction of an act and the office holder holds his position via an oath of office, which is done through the Governor-General's office. He gives an example of three types of offices that affect us on a daily basis. These are the Office of Taxation, with the example given of the ATO, whose office is created through the Public Services Act 1999, and whose office holder is the Commissioner for Taxation. 
and who is commissioned by an oath to the Queen's representative being the Governor-General. Our justice system is the second example, whose office is our courts, created through the District Courts Act 1969, and again whose office holder is the magistrates or judges, and are commissioned by an oath to the Queen's representative, the Governor-General. The final example is Government Departments. The office being Customs, which is created through the Customs Administrations Act 1985, and whose office holder is the Minister of Justice, who is commissioned by an oath to the Queen's representative, again being the Governor-General. Now, both of those things are dependent upon royal assent from the Governor-General, and also all of those office holders are dependent upon being appointed or commissioned by the Governor-General. Now that Governor-General himself is also an office holder of the office of Governor-General. So you see how here we're, we've got, an, in all of these instances, we've got an office and an office holder. And the common thread here, in this instance, when we're looking at federal departments and Commonwealth offices, is the office of the Governor-General. Right, so, the next step we'll do is we'll go back and look at the office of the Governor-General. Reason we want to do this is because that that's obviously the focus point for all of the uh, departments, it's all of the courts, the taxation, all of the people, the judges, the ministers, the officers, the commissioners, the whole lot, they're all dependent upon this office of the Governor-General. Now, for a little bit of uh, background on this, and uh, this leads to uh, where we're going as far as the determination of government being real government. If we go back to uh, 1900, and we don't even need to go anywhere near the Constitution just yet, we're just going to look at the office of the governor. Now, in 1900, there was a set of uh, documents called the Letters Patent, and they were issued by Queen Victoria that constituted the office of the Governor-General. Now, the wording in that document specified for the permanent provision of the office of Governor-General. Now, permanent, how, how long are we talking? Are we talking till next Tuesday? Um, till next week? Till Queen Victoria passed away? Permanent is permanent, right? Okay, so given that, Further down in those letters, Peyton, there was also a specific paragraph that talked about the revocation of those documents. It was a reservation of power and authority that said basically that it was only an heir and successor who could revoke, alter or amend those letters, Peyton, the original ones, uh, in accordance with the full power and authority. Without that, you've got these letters patent that remain as permanent. Now, what happened is in around about 1984, we got another set of letters patent that came along and have been sort of put in front of our noses. And they purportedly constituted another office of Governor General. Uh, we revoked the letters patent of 1900 as amended. Do they mean that they revoked an amended set of letters patent from 1900? Or do they mean they revoked an unamended original set of letters patent from 1900? Which form of letters patent are they talking about revoking? An amended one or an unamended one? I'm getting the impression that they're trying to talk about that they revoked an amended set of letters patent which would mean, back on our timeline, that somewhere between 1900 and 1984, there is somewhere another set of letters patent that are the amended set. Okay, so there is basically the one question that is all that's required to ask to determine which office of governor you're working upon. Is where those original letters patent passed under the great seal of the United Kingdom constituting the Office of Governor-General and Commander-in-Chief of the Commonwealth of Australia, dated 29th of October 1900, revoked, altered or amended by an heir and successor to the late Queen Victoria in full accordance with the power and authority reserved by her in 1900. 
That one question remains unanswered to this day. When you put it to the Governor-General, uh, the High Court of Australia, uh, Prime Minister, uh, I think Wayne Swan, uh, Nicola Roxon, basically anyone at that high level have just ducked and dodged answering that question. Which, given that document that came out in 1984 that offered that new set of letters patent, one would think that all, all that would be required to answer that question is to point at those documents and go, yes, yes, they did fulfil these requirements that were reserved back in 1900. We did do this properly. There's the evidence. Here's a uh, declaration that says we fulfilled the requirements. Pretty easy. Now, I've gone nearly, probably close on two years now without getting a suitable response to that question. So that in its own is uh, basically your answer. None of this is really new to a lot of people uh, that have been digging into this uh, rabbit hole. Some of you may have seen this uh, diagram from my website. This is just uh, a screenshot of the registration of the Commonwealth of Australia uh, listed up on the uh, Securities Exchange Commission website in Washington, D.C. So um, there's a few uh, little anomalies there. We're seeing annual reports and prospectuses and ownership, uh, business address. Uh, this is all find, file, uh, sorry, found under government, uh, sorry, um, company filings. It's not even in a separate section that says government filings. The tool that they're, uh, they've been using to, to do this has been the Uniform Commercial Code. The, the feedback from uh, any forays into the, the UCC has been, oh, it doesn't apply in Australia, it's, it's got nothing to do with Australia, it's not even used here. Is that sort of the feedback that some of you are getting? Yeah. Let's explore a uh, practical example here of uh, financing a car. So uh, say you go out and buy a, buy a car here in Australia and you, uh, you go along to a bank for a loan. What the, uh, the bank does is they act as the uh, secured party and they register a security interest in the collateral, which would be the car, and you act as the debtor having an obligation to the bank, which is that loan. Now, the question is here, in this case, that loan is the, the obligation that you've got back to that bank relative to the value of that collateral. Or are they disproportionate, or are they basically the same sort of thing? They're pretty much the same. So if you wanted to borrow more money, then they'd want to register interest in more collateral, like a car or a boat or something like that. Okay, now in Australia the mechanism they use to do that is actually uh, UCC. Uh, from 2009, within their, uh, their rule book, and when I say there I'm talking government, Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Code made its way into the Personal Property Securities Bill uh, 2009 and uh, is now known as the Personal Property Securities Register. So that's what happens if you go out and buy a car today on finance. You're the debtor, the bank's the secured party and the collateral is the, the car. We recently came across some documents that use the same terminology based in the uh, UCC. These documents were found registered within the Washington DC registry in um, well, Washington DC. And what they did was they recorded the secured party was the Federal Reserve Bank of New York 
And the debtor was, in this instance, uh, for this document, the Westpac Banking Corporation here in Australia. Now, the interesting thing was the collateral that they registered was essentially everything from now and hereafter. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York has got this registered interest in basically everything to do with Westpac Bank. What's the obligation, what's the size of the obligation that Westpac Bank has to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York? Now in this instance, again we ask that same question, is the registration in the collateral and the size of the collateral that they registered this interest in proportionate to the obligation from the debtor to the secured party. Would that be a fair assumption to make? Yeah. What we have taken from that feedback from uh, some of the auditors and uh, secure, what is it, the investment advisors or senior investment relationship manager at Westpac, uh, basically confirms the usage of the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC, is alive and kicking in Australia. We basically only need one example of that system being used here in Australia, and it's applicable here. Every dollar you earn represents your sweat equity. Your sweat equity is the energy you expend in order to create that dollar. That's why it's called currency. It's the currency of you represented in the digits in an account or the cash you hold in your hand. If a collateral account has been created for every individual that contains millions of dollars per account, as a result of that individual acting as security through the bonds created by government through our birth certificate, then everything is already prepaid. This is a breach of trust of massive proportions. That 14 quadrillion security is you. You. Your energy is a security that has been registered. They have created a bond from your birth certificate or rather collateralised you as a security in exchange for Federal Reserve notes. Governments of the world have bonded their people, essentially have turned their people into bonded debt slaves. Every government, not just the Australian government, has been registered as a corporation operating under the Uniform Commercial Code. Now how this is done is too complex to explain here, but suffice to say that you are the value.
That club has now been foreclosed on, defaulted if you like. A group of people acting as trustees created a public trust called the One People's Public Trust and used the same UCC system to make the filings and the claims that the governments of the world have been operating slavery systems which are unlawful universally. And should they be unable to rebut those claims, then the claims cure and the filings stand as law. The filings and claims were perfected on December 25, 2012, and now you can use these filings to point to a judgment that stands in law. The judgment being that they have been foreclosed on, or in the terms of the UCC code, they have defaulted by not rebutting the claims. The simplest explanation is this. When banks foreclose on your home, that is, default you on your mortgage, they point to a default notice that they have perfected. They do this through the UCC system. When they perfect a claim, it means it's cured. That means the time and opportunity to dispute the claims that the bank has made against you has lapsed and by default their claim stands as truth in law. In other words, you failed to rebut the claims, so by default, the bank's claim stands as truth. This is the default notice that the banks rely on in order to, through the courts, execute the remedy for the claim, which is the lien they have on your home. What the One People's Public Trust, or OPPT, have done is much the same. They created a trust and chose to act on behalf of the One People as trustees of the trust and assigned the One People as the beneficiaries of the trust. They then set about using the same systems the banks rely on, being the UCC law, that is the Uniform Commercial Code, which is the Bible of commerce law used all around the world and from which all commercial laws in every country is derived. Just as banks do, the trustees of the One People's Public Trust made a number of claims over a period of four years, claiming that the governments of the world have been corporations run for profit the banks have created and are creating slavery and debt slaves, and that the financial systems are corrupt for the benefit of a few. They then ran an investigation for some time and produced a report detailing the claims in plainer English than that that's provided in the filings themselves. This is called the Paradigm Report. Once the report was finalised and the claims submitted, they remained for a certain amount of time to give an opportunity for the claims to be rebutted by the world's banks and the governments. In a nutshell, the claim stated that government systems, civic systems, constitutions and the like were created for the purpose of placing elected individuals in a position of trust to manage and safeguard the natural trust and benefits of a country for and on behalf of the people. They also claimed that corporations are being used for the purpose of allowing individuals to act without responsibility to their fellow man protected by the limited liability afforded in corporations or companies. More importantly, that the natural trust was originally granted by the Creator and that the Creator has first and original jurisdiction over the one people. And unless the governments and corporations of the world can evidence to the contrary by a document bearing the verifiable signature of the Creator, then they have no jurisdiction over the one people. That claim was perfected on the 25th of December 2012 and remains unrebutted to this day. In other words, that means that all banks, governments, constitutions and corporations have been foreclosed or rather defaulted, just like the banks who point to a default notice, which is essentially a perfected claim, in order to take your home away, the One People's Public Trust points to a default notice again a perfected claim in order to take the authority of governments and corporations away. We are all now only answerable to the Creator. If you choose to be and do in full personal liability and responsibility, it can be likened to what is known in common law as a vicarious liability notice, except this time it's been done en masse and worldwide. They had created courtesy notices and they are just that, courtesy notices. A notice of courtesy to let the individual who may have sent you a fine or whatever it may be, 
know that the company or government department has been legally defaulted and foreclosed. And now, as a result, that individual is acting within their own individual and unlimited personal liability. It refers to, just as the banks do, the default notice filed at the Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington, D.C. The individual upon receiving a courtesy notice now only has two options. They can either rebut the notices and the filings or stop their actions causing harm and perpetuating the slavery systems, otherwise they face the full personal responsibility of all their actions. So does this mean that no one can work for a company any longer since they're all foreclosed? No, of course not. You can still work for a company, as long as you cause no harm. You have to be aware that we are all now, as at December 25, 2012 at least, operating in common law and working for and on behalf of any organisation whose intent and purpose is the harvesting of energy, that is, the harvesting of another being's sweat equity, currency, energy, etc., is absolutely forbidden whether this is done through man-made laws, policies, directives, laws, etc. It's all irrelevant. No individual has the right to harvest your measurable energy in any way in exchange for your right to share equally and equitably in the natural trust granted by the Creator without your consent or without the equitable exchange of like value. The trustees, after having created the trust and serving the purpose of the filings, then collapse the trust as it is no longer necessary. The reason for doing this is that each individual must now act in full responsibility of their actions and must therefore take full responsibility of their own lives on a path of self-determination, total transparency and freedom. Our technician is signaling me that we do have Anne on the line. Anne, do you hear us? I do hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Finally, we hear you. Welcome to OPPT Creation Radio Show, Hour of Truth. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Okay. Well, uh, uh, I would like to ask you a first question, and I would like to start with um, a really easy, easy one that you can answer in a single world, uh, w word. Is Australian government a private corporation? Yes. Okay. It is. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let, let's go to the second question for you. So, uh, uh, when did you learn that you are actually a corporate em employee and uh, how did you feel about that thingy? Well, I um, started looking into OPPT about the middle of January of this year and I spoke with Scott Bartle who uh, was the person to reveal this and um, as it rolled on I uh, <laughs> just started to look at the laws that we were making again and it all just fitted perfectly because we had moved so far away from constitutional law and uh, I found out that we'd been under maritime admiralty corporate law for a very, very long time and that's actually why people can't get justice in the courts. Yeah. So, um, uh, what about your colleagues? Are, are they aware of the fact that they are also a private corporate employees? Well, they say they're not, but I believe they do know. Um, you know, it's a bit like the Agenda 21 thing. If you deny it, then it's not real. But I think they're going to get a very rude wake-up call very soon. Okay, uh, uh, since you uh, joined us uh, a little bit late, uh, let me... Say a few words about you and who you really who you really are. So, uh, Anne Bressingtons is the independent member of Legislative Council. Uh, she was elected in South Australian Parliament in 2006 as uh, as the uh, independent uh, independent uh, uh, member. So, um, you do have some inside uh, inside knowledge about how uh, how your government operates and uh, what is going on, uh, what is going on, and, and, and sort of things. So, tell me tell me a little bit about these uh, UCC filings that you were pointed to. Uh, 
this UCC filing said that uh, the, 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 uh, the all governments of the world and all the financial institutions of the world and, and practically everything else is, is foreclosed. Uh, can you com uh, comment on that, that fact? Well, when I first found out about the UCC filings, I um, contacted a lawyer that I've known for a very, very long time, a retired corporate lawyer, and I sat down with him for about six hours, and he went through the filings that I had and the information, and he said to me, well, you know, this has absolutely got legs, which means this is right, but what is going to be the problem is how this will be enforced. And he said uh, what it's going to take is for, you know, a large percentage of the population to understand what this means and what actions they need to take. Yeah. Um, and of course, in Australia, um, things move very slowly over here. And uh, But I do believe that all of the resignations last week of those ministers had something to do with the UCC filings. I haven't got anything solid on that. It's just what I believe, as far as I know. I, I don't have access to uh, international intelligence, but um, I would be more inclined to think that um, they've all been served. I know they have, yeah. with um, courtesy notices and final notices. And they know that the top top people know that they've been foreclosed on. And I think they can see what's happening all around the world. And um, they've decided to try and get out while they can. Because I honestly don't think we are going to be able to stop the change that is taking place. I think consciousness is waking up. I really do. I believe that we are all connected to everything. But ultimately, the thing that we are connected to the most is this beautiful earth that we live on. And I think the earth itself is waking up. There is a process happening here. The energies are just different now. It's different to what it was last year. And people are beginning to feel that there is change in the air. It's coming. It's, it's there. I can feel it. All we have to do is keep positive and keep fighting the good fight and keep exposing the tyranny and the corruption and the criminality of this world the way we do. But maintain a focus on the solutions. And when you present a problem to someone, at least offer a suggestion as to what the solution may be or at least offer a pathway to meaningful dialogue to discuss a solution if you don't have one. Personally, I believe the solution is in global unity. I believe the solution is in mutual respect for others. And by global unity, folks, no, I'm not saying New World Order. What I'm saying is that you just respect each other. You realize that the way to live your life is in La Cache. That is really the way to do it. I mean, the, the amount of people I've had attacking me lately as well, folks, people have been sending me hate mail because I haven't reacted in the way that they perceive I should have reacted. They've accused me of claiming to be things that I've never claimed to be. I mean, the amount of hate mail I've received for daring to have the people from the OPPT on the show and for not taking one particular side in the matter is phenomenal. And it's very interesting to see how people are actually revealing themselves. And we're going to see a lot of trials and tribulations like this, folks. But it's important through it all to maintain respect for each other. And I know we all have lapses of that, folks. Sometimes I just want to swear at people, and sometimes I do, because these are very, very testing times with the energies changing so rapidly the way they are. But keep supporting each other during the process, and we're going to find ways through it. All the pieces of the puzzle seem to be coming together at the moment, and there are going to be so many people that are resistant to this change. You're going to see so many people, even within the alternate research community, who are so invested in the fight that they're not going to want anything to change. Many people who talk about creating a fantastic new world where everybody is free and we all live in a state of abundance are going to resist the change to that freedom and abundance with tooth and nail, folks. And we're seeing this in the alternate research community now. 
And one thing I think is important to understand through all of this change, folks, is that there is not one person or one group of people that has all of the answers. In all honesty, I think we are being pushed to do so by our collective consciousness and by the consciousness of this earth that we are connected to. But as the collective memory comes more and more online, you're going to see a huge resistance to this from people who have a vested interest in maintaining the fight. You're going to find a lot of people through this period attacking others and attacking anybody who doesn't support their particular system. You'll find a lot of people seeing anybody else's perspective as an attack against them and their ego will kick in and they'll wish to fight back and they'll hang on to their beliefs with tooth and nail. But what you're really going to find is that there are aspects of all of these systems which are good and which need to be all merged together. And you're going to see that, you know, with the knowledge that we've got, because we have an incredible amount of knowledge as a species, folks, especially in the alternate research community. I mean, if I may say so myself, the people in the alternate research community, many of these people have gone down particular rabbit holes and they become very, very knowledgeable in their own fields. But unfortunately, through that process, many of them have also become very egotistical about the knowledge that they hold. And so they are not prepared to look outside of their field and to respect anybody else's research or anybody else's perspective. But we need to merge all of this together and we need to merge this knowledge that we have gathered as a single consciousness. Because once we find the ultimate truth, which is the ultimate truth of ourselves, then we're able to move forward as a species in harmony with itself. And there is so much knowledge there for us, folks. And I have uh, one guest, <laughs> uh, Rena Iliadis, and we're still uh, trying to get uh, Anne Bessington, Bressington rather, on the show. So, um, being there as a group of the uh, of the public, very peaceful that you were, um, you obviously have the right to be in there and ask questions. So, <laughs> apparently not, Santos. <laughs> well, the only thread I can see is that. We're asking questions. That's the threat. That's the only threat. I mean, what, what else is there? Mm. We're in there. We're asking questions and we've got a video recorder. What's the problem? How is that a threat? How is that a reason to bring, you know, eight police cars on there, you know, out there and, and have over 15 policemen? Yeah. You know, how is that a threat? Get on with it. Hey, hey, that's part of the job. 
can't handle it, get out. It's a threat to the commerce, sister. Yeah, they they run on commerce, you know, and they're looking at the clock all the time and generating income for their corporation. And, you know, a couple of inquisitive little public types sitting in their meetings asking them intellectual and very pertinent questions which they cannot seem to answer because they do not have the gift of articulation for some reason, um, or they are criminals and they know they are acting as criminals and they're just mm. going to impose their predetermined will on the Council of Melton anyway, oh, whatever no, the club of Rome. <laughs> yeah, whatever we're the club. The criminals. <laughs> apparently, we're the criminals. <laughs> you know, we're the ones that were causing a riot and causing a disruption, and um, you know, and in fact, they even went to the extent that they needed all these police there to protect them from these, you know, criminals that were asking questions with a video camera. They can see a huge awakening of people. Now people are actually doing what was proposed to them a long time ago. Now you can see all these different groups falling together and really interacting with each other and, and just getting on and doing stuff. I mean, we get these other groups of people that say, oh, well, you're not doing enough and you're not doing this. You need to get people together. You're already together. You're already doing things together. Every little part of this is now coming together. We see these things on, on the news all the time. You look at Turkey, you look at Egypt, you look at Brazil, you look at all these other places. If that's not people coming together, I don't know what is. It just doesn't have to be here on your doorstep. You have to look at the broader picture. The broader picture is immense. The energy that's flowing through all this is absolutely immense. They cannot stop it. It's like a tidal wave energy firing and flowing about four million miles an hour now and there is nothing to stop it so all of the bunkers out there about the being and doing is, is just all a lot of rubbish it is working and it is having a huge effect you look in australia to or this week alone we got rid of the prime minister then seven front benches they all just quit now we got the, the same old same old back it doesn't matter You've got to understand that all this has been foreclosed on. So for us to keep fighting the system means that you're still recognising them as the system. So the system's already foreclosed. It's gone. There's no more left. When we carry on fighting something that's not really there, then it means you're creating a problem. The problem being that you are still giving that non-entity as such energy. So of course it still looks like it's there. If you stop fighting the system, the system cannot function. If you stop it, then you'll find out very quickly that the system needs us. We don't need it. When they fall over, go and help them up. I mean, there's millions and millions and millions of people now waking up to this every day. When we sit in our little separate groups and, and think that we're doing something different to someone else, you're not, you're doing exactly the same and it's having an effect. All the hard yards have been done. All the people have been notified. All the people now have said, okay, we've had enough. The fight is over. The foreclosures have happened. So now it's time to play. Thanks for listening.